Um, so we are moving now to uh, the presentation by Johan Alves and Ola Edvin. Um, Johan, whenever you're ready to load your presentation, um, go for it. Thank you. Uh, I was actually trying to cannibalize for my own time here with a question for Nicole, but uh, <laughs> Nicole will pick that up later. I am trying to find the right Hi, everyone. Um, um, yeah, this is what I'm going to talk about. And um, if I'm saying anything stranger, so I will you feel free to ask a question afterwards and I will pass that on to Ole Edwin Vie, who is my co-author. And since he's fortunately here, I'm guessing he will be able to answer all the tricky questions. If you have any easy questions, just bring them on to me. Anyway, this paper has a bit of a weird origin, if you like. Ulla approached me with a set of data and an idea around pastoral power, knowing I'm interested in, um, in Foucault and Foucault's notion, various notions of power. But the interesting thing is that this coincided with a conversation I had with my wife. She's a manager, she's a headmaster for school. And uh, she told me that she had just bought a new box of Kleenex to have at her desk at work. Because all the time, people were coming into her office and crying. And not about work, but about their spouses, their children, and their bowel issues and whatnot. So people were coming into her room and basically relieving their hearts. And I found that very fascinating. I couldn't imagine myself doing the same thing. So I was starting to think about what was what is it, what is that's going on here? And sort of the same week, Ulla approached me with this idea that we are now trying to develop into a, a sort of a coherent-ish argument. Um, this is one of the observations we're building on. Henry tells me this calling Colin, one of his employees on a long-term sick leave. Speaking to Colin, Henry's voice is more soft-spoken than usual. He starts with a greeting, asks Colin how things are. Apparently has just returned back home after a hospital admission. Henry doesn't say very much. He just listens to Colin's history and lets him steer the conversation. As far as I can tell, Colin talks about his treatment, his prognosis, and his state of health. So here we have an observation of a manager showing care towards one of his employees who's not at work, but following up, uh, showing that it, that the employee still matters, that that he's interested in Colin's uh, well-being, and so on and so forth. And to some extent, extent you can say, well, this just illustrates how emotions are an integral part of everyday organizational life. And that's sort of a key point here. We are interested in this paper to explore this personal and emotional aspects of relationships and relational leadership, if you like. That's the literature we're trying to position ourselves in relation to, haha. Uh -huh. And how these are intertwined by more in instrumental concerns and power relations. So we start from a relation leadership perspective seeking to understand how power seeps into the co-construction of leadership and followership relations in mundane everyday work in the setting of knowledge intensive firms. And in order to do this, we're using the idea from Foucault of pastoral power and not as just a vague overarching concept, but we're actually trying to look at the specific practices that Foucault wrote about in terms of pastoral power with care and confession, how this creates rather intricate interdependencies in the organization. But being about power, uh, we're of course also interested in how this relational aspect, if you like, of power also reproduces more overarching uh, concerns and interests. So starting with relation leadership, uh, Kenneth and Erickson said that we need to turn our attention to the importance of mundane small details, actions and conversations, and call this relational practices that they are char characterized by collaboration, empathy, empathy, trust, empowerment. 
and a way of being in relation to others. And thereby also recognizing the relational aspect of leadership and followership, leader and follower identities, that these are fluid, they are contested, and so on and so forth. But also that aspects such as management or manipulation, what I have called the dirty sides of leadership, also play into this. And they are often, I would argue, glossed over by those mainly interested in leadership and tr that, that try to distance themselves from, from management. So this view here is a bit simplified, but there are two key points, I think, in relation to this. Uh, one being that relations when you look at leadership research, often relationship is basically a line between two boxes. I like this, of course, not like that. So a line, that's the relationship. What we want to do here is to basically answer to Conlef and Erickson's call, trying to dig into these, unpack these relationships a bit more closely, using power as, as a main lens. The other thing is that Early critical leadership studies, if you remember the paper by Alveson and Svenningson about extraordinarization, the mundane, I would say that they, that's an unfortunate outcome of that debate is that these small every, everyday things are not leadery enough to count as leadership. And we basically disagree with that. And that's what we're trying to illustrate here in this paper. Our main theoretical lens then is pastoral power, a, pow a form of power whose ultimate aim is to assure individual salvation in the next world. So Foucault here talks about pastoral power in a very religious sense, and um, it largely builds on, or it, it's ah, trying to reach for a book here. It's something that this unpublished book, The History of Sexuality, Volume 4, Confessions of the Flesh, uh, is concerned with. Uh, that was, of course, posthumously published. Um, but he has, uh, we're referring here to his 1982 paper uh, about the subject and power, I think it is. The idea here is to look after the whole community, the individuals over the lifespan. The, the basic metaphor is the pastor and the herd, the shepherd and the herd. And it's about the pastor caring for the other, but also the pastor exposing him or herself, uh, being ready to take, uh, well, the, 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 if you look at a Western movie, the, when, the, when the hero pastor goes out in, for, in front of the outlaws and takes a bullet, that is basically the sacrifice that the pastoral position in pastoral power ha has to deal with, has to engage with. So the Christian confession here is a key part of pastoral power. It's a confession to someone. There's, you have to tell your thoughts. You have to expose your inner self to this other, to the pastor, in order for the pastor to guide you, to help you find your way in life. And this is rewarded by care. The pastor reciprocally cares for you. It's not, we don't want to see this as a simple exchange, of course, but it is a relationship that the, if the confession is supposed is meaningful, it, it is reflected by care. And for care to be enacted, we need the confession. So they exist in a very tight relationship to each other. And this means that care and the um, companion term consideration becomes key. So caring for another person is an individualized form of work. We have to do care. It relies on face-to-face -face interaction, according to Yanis Gabriel, COVID, pre-COVID text, of course. Uh, but it is something deeply personal and deeply emotional about care. But how to care for can also be a very it can be instrumental. It can be done without necessarily containing emotion. Uh, so we discuss this in terms of care and consideration. So consideration, the activities 
that are that enact care and care underscores this additional dimension of uh, the emotional dimension of care uh, and this becomes important um, in, in in our analysis actually or hopefully i guess so the idea here is this is a part of a power relationship this uh, this paper is built on shadowing and um, interviews with people in two different R&D departments in a Norwegian knowledge intensive firm. So lots of time being put into this field notes, interviews and so on and so forth. Um, so a rather rich and thick empirical study. And this empirical study i'm just going to give you four examples here from the four one example each from the four themes um, that we have observed one is how these managers move around in the organization physically walk around and show consideration so henry stops by martin and asks if kent is available to work on a technical test on one of the projects um, Kent's just become a father, so he and he's not like locked into any project for work for the moment. After the discussion and uh, discussing another issue, Henry leaves the office, walks down to the hall to Kent's office, congratulates Kent, showing um, consideration, perhaps even care, asks if everything is going well, how is his work schedule looking, uh, is it available for work after the Easter holidays, and uh, yes, he, he he apparently is then. So. Here is one example. It's a micro thing. It, this is something rather normal, hopefully not rather normal. Someone, someone actually caring about someone has having become a father. But we also have these micro confessions where here we have Harold and Greg um, in, a, in an exchange um, where after after some time when revising uh, a presentation where Harold is very frustrated, he gradually opens up and he, he's, he, he, he basically unfreezes, if you like, uh, and becomes more positive towards, towards, the, um, towards, this, um, towards this project. Uh, but it's interesting here that he confesses he in all in the process of overcoming this there's an, a confession and that is met by sympathy and understanding and this is it's not something dramatic it's not someone crying there's no kleenex tissues here but these micro things in everyday interactions seem to be important we argue also that there is a demand for this. It's important that the leader has the ability and empathy enough to look behind, below the surface, employee 9 says. And I don't expect the line manager to be a discussion partner on a private term, but if personal matters should come in to, to interfere with the work, it's natural to talk about it. So here we find one element of the link between these processes and everyday work and the instrumentality of this. And this becomes really clear in this quote from Henry, a line manager. I have one employee who unfortunately has gotten cancer, serious cancer diagnosis, who is 63. It's important for the employees here to see that if they come in the same situation, that the workplace cares about you. I genuinely, genuinely care about him, but I know in the back of my head that it serves more than one purpose. So this is just four dips with our toes into the uh, into the essence of this paper, which is, as I said, uh, very empirically oriented. But what is interesting here in theoretical terms is that managers took this responsibility for the employees engaged in an emotional commitment at the same time as they saw how this played into the overall objectives of the firm. We're not saying that the managers are pretending. I think they genuinely care. And they do this through these mundane managerial activities which are become central in this enactment of pastoral power. The devil here is certainly in the details. So building here again then on Conniff and Ericsson. But we also see this as sort of a moral power matrix that managers are expected to show care, even if they do, subordinates don't confess. So it's not a transaction. 
The subordinates are expected to confess, even if they are not rewarded with care, but the, du uh, the duality of this is what usually goes down and confession and care build on each other. It's also built into the formal, uh, formal system. It becomes a way of negotiating the material working conditions. But, and, and, or through that rather, pastoral power is very productive. It helps the organization going. It helps the organization to run smoothly, whereas at the same time, it creates a situation where individ what we call in dependent individuality arises, a tension with, with, on the one hand, a sense of independence and control, because by confessing you place a moral responsibility on the manager to take care of you and thereby influence your work situation. And by being cared for, you're careful, cared for, you are on the other hand in the hands of the manager for this salvation, of course, big words here, but salvation writ small, I guess, and rely on this manager's goodness and responsibility for your well-being at the workplace. And I do think I actually managed to stay on time. Not only did you manage to stay on time, but you have one minute left uh, if you want to add some. <laughs> well, I, I, will leave that to, I will leave that to Ola to uh, add on and cover for all my mistakes. Ola, do you want to add something? Um, not, not really much, but but I'm very happy that you have picked up on, on the main ideas and we have had a long uh, uh, discussion going on from the start of the, uh, the pandemic. So so we're still still working on this and it's uh, it will be great to have some feedback on it. Uh, great. Well, uh, at that note, I will invite our uh, audience to pose questions or to raise hands. And uh, uh, whilst they ponder their questions, I have a few of my own. And uh, I was very curious about that kind of care devoid of emotion. And, um, you know, it, it is an interesting framing and I never thought about care in those terms. So I was just wondering if you could elaborate a bit on, uh, on this kind of care devoid of emotion. Where does the impetus for such care derive from? Yeah, and I, I think this is where the, this analytical distinction between care and consideration comes into play, because at least in my view, we are, researchers often seem to have an assumption that what's going on in organizations is really, if you like, authentic, that people don't pretend, that people don't role play, uh, by, but by trying to disentangle care and consideration, I think it's possible to draw attention to the pretense that is going on in organizations, the face work. This is classic Goffmanian observations, of course, uh, but I think they are rarely taken into, uh, into account in research, which I find a bit strange. So and I think leadership research is particularly vulnerable for this critique, enthusiastic followers. Yeah, of course you're an enthusiastic follower if someone sets your salary. You, that's obvious. So, um, so it's a way of opening up, if you like, that, uh, that discussion. Uh, thanks, Johan. Uh, that's, that's really helpful and insightful. I do have more questions, but I also see some uh, raised hands. Uh, Nick Winchester. Nick, would you like to ask us to pose your question? Sorry, hi there. Thanks for that presentation. That's kind of really interesting. I was just kind of reflecting back because obviously I did a paper on care yesterday. Uh, and it's interesting to think about it in a kind of different space. Um, my first sort of point was that if we think about care as being devoid of emotion, well, the people from the ethics with care perspective would say that isn't care. So they'd have a conceptual way to make that distinction. And I think that actually might be quite interesting to, you know, talk about care in a different way. Um, I was wondering, I mean, there's a lot of critique of the kind of care literature that it doesn't account for power. And obviously, if you start with Foucault, then you're going to get an account of power. But I wondered if by bringing in Foucault, 
we get an account of care that's too embroiled with care, uh, too embroiled with power, that we don't get a normative pull of a different account of care. So we get power, but because of Foucault and because of the kind of overwhelming emphasis on power, I would say in Foucault, that we get an account of, we don't, we lose a bit of analytical purchase and that if we frame the question in terms of Foucault, we're going to come out with power anyway. So are we kind of limiting our conceptual resources? But that's just a reflection. No, thanks, Nick. I, I, I think that's a good reflection. And I think that honestly, and, and, and this is, I don't know whether this paper is the place to address it, but I think it's an important reflection and it's important in two senses. One, that yes, uh, Foucauldians often, you know, we will find power. Of course, you're going to bloody well find power. It's, it's obvious. But it's also an underutilization of Foucault, because looking at some of Foucault's writings, you find his ideas about subjugated discourses, about non-discursive forms of power or of interaction. Uh, not everything, I would argue, is power in Foucault, but this takes us into a longer discussion about the distinction between discourses and discursive formations, for instance. But good point. Um, and I think we need to be careful to uh, at least, uh, as in any analysis, of course, uh, be, you know, be able to illustrate that we've not at least not been too blindsided by, uh, by a romance for a particular theory. So thanks for bringing it up, Nick. If I can make a very short comment, uh, Nick. Um, uh, we are well aware of uh, uh, the work of uh, Leah Tompkins, who has done uh, interesting stuff on, on care and, and in, in the past few years really connected that to power as well. So we are, we are not, not alone in this field, but, but it's, I, I can see your point that uh, if you start with Foucault, you will end up with power that is... Uh, that is uh, seems natural, but, but but I think we are able to show it in a more mundane fashion than perhaps have been done before. And and in particular, we are uh, very fascinated by this confession practice by uh, by the knowledge workers here. Thanks, uh, Johan and Ola and Nick. Um, Fatima, you wanted to ask a question. Um, yes, uh, thank you. Um, it just comes to my mind when uh, you mentioned co confession that there is an element of trust. I'm just wondering um, about the, the context of the relation um, between the manager and uh, uh, the employee. Um, uh, um, uh, for example, do they have like a... a um, have they been working, for example, for uh, for years together? I, I just would like to know about the context more. I guess that was a difficult question, Johan, so I'm taking that. <laughs> uh, um, the answer is, is yes. Um, they have usually been working uh, together for quite some time. Um, this is a Norwegian setting, and uh, in high tech in Norwegian, the turnover is it seems to be quite low, and the hierarchy is is kind of low, so so you don't have much turnover by the managers. So the manager would likely to stay on as as the closest supervisor for for many years. Uh, but we have I have done interviews with subordinates which have trouble with the manager. Which I also have followed. So, so there is. So the manager doesn't have a good relation with everybody, but he, from my point of view, he seems to behave in the same way towards all his his uh, his uh, knowledge workers, even though the relationship is a bit different between them. And just adding on to that, bringing it back to my highly idiosyncratic and anecdotal example with my wife, these in these kind of situations actually started to occur just a few weeks after she began as a manager. And I think that, at least to me, signifies that there is something here that's more than just a question of personal relationships. It's a question of institutionalized expectations of what, what it is that you're supposed to do. And I can confirm that this because I have, when I did this uh, interviews with 20 of the employees, 
some of them were actually hired quite recently and they still had the same expectation towards the manager and the same expectation for them to uh, confess if there was private things coming up. So, so I think it's, it's something about what is expected in general here. Thank you. Thank you for me. Uh, we have a question from Gareth. Gareth, would you like to put your mic on? Hi, Johan. Hi, Ola. Hi, Hi Fritz. Yeah. <laughs> um, just a couple of comments, really. Um, one is um, this issue of care devoid of emotion. Um, I, I wonder whether that might be a little bit of a sidetrack because I think you'd have to work quite hard to find any space devoid of emotion, um, especially in relational terms. So I think, you know, it's either unpicking what the emotions are, um, but I'm not sure you'd be able to do that going back to the data necessarily, um, or, or just being careful in, in how you conceptualise that, uh, really, um, in my mind. Um, going back to sort of Nick's point around you, know, the challenges that you might face by those that are involved in uh, theorising care uh, as such. Um, the, the point I find interesting, actually, is your your comment, Johan, around seeing relational as this line, you you directly from leader to follower, which is you know, how I guess quite a lot of us draw it on a whiteboard or, or whatever it might be to try and you engage students in this notion of relationality. And what I'm seeing in your data and the way that you're sort of uh, thinking about your data is actually the multiplicity of relationships that's going on at that point in time, at any point in time. You know, so the, these managers are, are having to deal with not just their relationship with uh, subordinates, but the relationship with their organisation, with their department, with their budget, with themselves. You know, there's a, there's a lot of stuff going on in there that I think it'd be useful to, to unpack. Um, uh, and, and, and I think coming from it from a sort of multiple voiced perspective, um, using something like Bactin, for example, might be quite useful in unpicking, unpicking that, you know, so just a couple of comments. Sorry for the delay here, Gareth. I was taking notes, which only signif signifies the importance we we put to, to your comments. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, I'm... Um, yeah, I think that is spot on and that these are issues around part of this is some things that we, we weren't able to convey in this short presentation, of course. Um, but I think that these are aspects that we will certainly have to unpack and be a bit more specific and nuanced and careful uh, about when doing the analysis. So thanks a lot for that, Gareth. If I can add one thing, Gareth, and, and thank you for your comment. I, I, I think it would be fair to say that, that the conceptualization of, of consideration uh, is uh, the starting point for that is actually that we have uh, observational data. And you, you can't go around and ask the manager all the time, what, what are you thinking now? What are you feeling now? So I, I think the starting point to say that consideration is just the behavior part of the care element is coming from the from the, the how we have collected or uh, I collected the data. So, so but but I, I think you're totally right that we should look a bit more into it and be a bit more careful of, of how we're phrasing that. Thank you. Um, we have a few more minutes. Uh, so I would like to, I don't see any uh, hands raised. Um, so I would like to kind of... Uh, Which probably means no, we were either very clear or, or very boring. No, or oh, not at all. Uh, not, not at all. It, it's just very, you know, unusual and interesting concept to grapple with. So, uh, you know, I'm sure our audience minds are also trying to kind of uh, have too many questions, in fact. Um, if I could just uh, kind of amalgamate mine to uh, what uh, Fatima uh, uh, started. Um, so what does such uh, formulation of care means for trust? Uh, you know, trust that we know is a cornerstone of relationality. So how do you envisage, uh, you know, 
theorizing that side of care. Will do you see trust featuring in your um, in your writing about this? Uh, is this a difficult question, Johan? So I can start. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I think some of the things that is 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 not presented is that um, um, this is a matrix organization where you have delivery projects and you have a line organization, and this is the line manager who we have studied the most. And the line manager is, is also responsible for his employees' uh, sick leaves, uh, in general uh, health and security and all those things. So, so in one way, the employees are forced to, 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 to trust their closest supervisor. Uh, because the system is that. If, if, if they have trouble in a project, they would go to their line manager and, and say that, okay, this is too much. I'm overworked. Can you help me? And it's also the line manager that would, would accept uh, uh, overwork or not. So you have a, a safety, uh, what is the term, Johan? Safety ventil? Safety net? Yeah, safety net by the line manager. Thank you. Um, I saw a hand raised by uh, Magnus Larsen. Magnus, would you like to pose a question? We have a minute left, I think. <laughs> okay, so I'll speak very quickly. Uh, I'm question, just a question about, you're, you're talking about this, the relationality and that, as I understand it, that the managers have no problem or they sort of link this to the overall organization or whatever. So they're sort of linking this connection, the emotional care, or the, the care for the employee to the organizational goals, if I got it right. So well, it, this is sort of well, where the care and consideration do. Yeah, so my, my, my chair, I would like to challenge that. So, so I mean, you, you get that from an interview, right? Yeah, so, <clears throat> so, so that wouldn't that just be the expected moral account of the manager for what he or she does? What else would be possible in the, in the interview situation morally? Uh, good, good question. But I would actually say that bringing in this instrumentality, basically destroying your own image as being a very caring human being, that's rather detrimental. So um, I'm, I, I, I see the point. And of course, and that's another paper, vocabularies of care, right? And um, very short. Uh... I think it's uh, in another paper which was published <laughs> too long ago. Uh, and I have this episode of the one of the senior or second level manager fixing key for his employee. So, so all these line managers were very much on the service side and they're, they understood their job as making sure that the knowledge worker were as productive as possible. So they were doing all kinds of silly practical stuff. And uh, so, yeah. Thank you all very much um, for this thought provoking concept and, and, and paper. We have to, I'm sorry, I apologize about my dog uh, <laughs> reacting to your paper. Um, uh, so we have to move on now to.